morning, everyone, and welcome to our service this morning on this beautiful summer's morning. Any visitors that are here, welcome. We would like to sing as the, we do have electricity today, we'd like to you to join us for some coffee and tea afterwards, and do enjoy the, the service with us. Um, if I could just open in prayer quickly, so we can dedicate this time to the Lord. Lord, we thank you that we can come here today to hear your word and to worship you. We thank you for your mercy, for your grace. But most of all, we thank you for the precious gift of your son, Jesus Christ, who died for our sins. We pray that as we hear the word from Malachi this morning, that you might open our hearts, that we might understand, and that it might affect what we do, so that it might change our actions. We thank you for this time together. We pray that you will bless this time. In Jesus' name. Amen. Later. Uh, when Jesus wa walked the earth with his disciples, he often drew aside to a quiet place to pray. Now, if Jesus, the Son of God, did that, how much more important is it that we do that in our lives? Now, I encourage you this week to get into that discipline, to get into that habit, to draw aside and speak to your Father. Now, when he'd done this, on one occasion, one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us how to pray. And that's how we came to get the Lord's Prayer. So if we could all stand so that we can say the Lord's Prayer together. <coughs> right. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Good morning, church family. Well, this morning uh, marks our first communion service for 2023, possibly. And uh, I think we need to examine our hearts before we come to that table, how we start this year, especially in line of the last two sermons that we've heard and possibly the sermon that we'll hear today will remind us just how short we fall of God's glory. And then we're reminded by, in the book of Romans by Paul, he says, we have all fallen short of the glory. All of us have sinned. It's uh, a truth, every single one of us. But then there is where God comes through for us in the book of 1 John, where he says, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. So this morning I thought before I pray, let's just have half a minute of silence where you can bring your heart before God and examine yourself. Let's be quiet. Our gracious and loving Father, all powerful in all your ways, Infinite God of the universe, its expanses declares the work of your hands, its expanses reveals the depth of your love, and yet you are right here this morning. For before time you loved us with so great a love that it has spanned beyond generations, everlasting to everlasting, from the word of the psalmists, righteousness and justice are the foundation of your throne. Steadfast love and faithfulness go before you. And hearing these words and the sounds of the song, the steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning, as they are new this very morning. And indeed, how great is your faithfulness. O oh Lord, and how we, we should thank you for the redemption through our Savior, Jesus Christ, in his living Dying and rising, we are unable to fathom the immensity of your grace. 
applied to us through the Holy Spirit. For you are more worthy than we humanly could express, and your grace abounds daily upon us in the many comforts and blessings of life, for the very gift of life alone today. Joy and love, family, friends and fellowship given to us out of the riches of your love, your great love revealed to us from your holy word, the holy word of life. For without its truth, our world stands in darkness, filled with sin, failure and weaknesses, for which we are not immune. We too often stumble and fall and come up way short and are in constant need of your forgiveness and sustaining grace. As again we do this morning, help us at the start of this year not to again sit back and become desensitized in the frequent partaking, but help us in remembering what is done for us. Let us be cut to the heart when in hearing the, those words, take this and eat, take this and drink, remembering what Christ did for you. And let us be thankful. Yes, so thankful with sincere repentant hearts at being cleansed from all unrighteousness. And in this we humbly acknowledge your greatness, your goodness and kindness to us who trust in Christ. Knowing that you are full of compassion and slow to anger a loving Father, you comfort us in all our afflictions and your promises give us life and hope. The hope so needed today on those who have fallen upon life's difficult times, those who hurt emotionally, physically, those of our family, and for others that are silent before you right now, and the ones presently in our thoughts. What do we do this morning? We speak the name of Jesus into their circumstances and into their conditions, for in there, there is power, there is healing, there is life. Oh, would you alleviate their plight? Would you walk them through those shadows? Would you burn through their lives with this? Help them, Lord. Let them know that they will be encouraged. Help those that help them, that you would promise them and strengthen them. And now, Father, we pray for our country. Yes, our beloved South Africa, knowing that you are sovereign in all your ways. You are above all, every kind of authority, knowing that in the truth that all, yes, all will someday be called to give an account and they will reap what they sow. Again, hear our prayer to raise up godly leadership within their departments. Bless all who serve within the denomination in our church for Jomo and Brenda and family, our church council, Bible study leaders, for our Sunday school teachers we pray for, and for Paul, our youth leader, to reignite the youth. May they all continue to lead us forward into being purposeful in the extension of your kingdom. And now, Father, bless Jomo as he brings us your word, as it challenges us and keeps us from conforming to the ways of the world or in bringing our second best, or just a going through the motions or a mediocre efforts towards you, but that we be washed in your word, devoting ourselves to prayer, being watchful in reverence, yielding our lives and our wills to you. Shine your light in us through us and over us, to bring you alone the glory, now and forever. In Jesus' name, we ask and we pray. Amen. Amen. Good morning, everyone. Today's reading can be found on page 968 of your Pew Bibles. We're reading from Malachi 1. Verses 6 to 14. A son honors his father, and a servant his master. If then I am a father, where is my honor? And if I am a master, where is my fear, says the Lord of hosts, to you, O priests, who despise my name? But you say, how have we despised your name by offering polluted food upon my altar? But you say, how have we polluted you 
by saying that the Lord's table may be despised. When you offer blind animals in sacrifice, is that not evil? And when you offer those that are lame or sick, is that not evil? Present that you present that to your governor. Will he accept you or show you favor? Says the Lord of hosts. And now entreat the favor of God, that he may be gracious to you with such a gift from your hand. Will he show favor to any of you, says the Lord of hosts? Oh, that there were one among you who would shut the doors, that you might not kindle fire on my altar in vain. I have no pleasure in you, says the Lord of hosts, and I will not accept an offering from your hand. For from the rising of the sun to its setting, my name will be great among the nations, and in every place incense will be offered to my name, and a pure offering. For my name will be great among the nations, says the Lord of hosts. But you profane it when you say that the Lord's table is polluted and its fruit, that is, its food, may be despised. But you say, what a weariness this is, and you snort at it, says the Lord of hosts. You bring what you have has been taken by violence, or is lame or sick, and this you bring as your offering? Shall I accept that from your hand, says the Lord? Cursed be the cheat who has a male in his flock and vows it, and yet sacrifices to the Lord what is blemished. For I am a great king, says the Lord of hosts, and my name will be feared among the nations. This is the word of the Lord. Well, good morning again, church family. I'm going to pray first, and we're going to go straight to that passage. Leslie, thank you for reading it and reading it so well indeed. And I hope you just, you had God's heart in that passage as Les was reading it. Let me pray and let's um, seek God's wisdom. Father, you have entrusted us to us so many good things. So many good things. And yet somehow we have managed to master the art of bringing to you only the leftovers or to offer to you that which we don't need or to offer to you grudgingly that which we love and even when we do we give you the list of those things it's a sin we want to confess to you this morning. Acknowledge our shortcomings, that we have prioritized things that you have not called us to prioritize. And we have used our time, our money, our gifts towards those things. And very little was brought to you. Speak to us this morning, Lord, we pray. And above all, soften our hearts, because so often we understand the message, but our hearts are so hard and so devoted to these things that we keep giving the best to them. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Um, I want you to think with me here. Gifts. Gifts are great things. And we all enjoy receiving gifts. But have you ever received a gift and felt disappointed by the gift? 
You sit with your friend or your partner and you discuss your birthday and the potential gifts, you know, the hints we give for those gifts. And you really would like that handbag and you really would like those techies because the ones you've got, they're really old and you're not enjoying the runs in the morning or the walks. And then come birthday and there is a gift nicely wrapped in a second hand packet and what are you open and it's a great brand it's Nike Techies but they are about six years old and she picked them up at SPCA for you <laughs> it's that handbag and you can see it's, it's moldy inside but he thought you could clean that up and it, 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 he thought it was a good deal Huh? Maybe I'm giving an extreme example. But you know that moment when someone gives you a gift and you're excited about the gift and you open the gift and you feel, how? My God, I bo. I bo. What is this now? Okay? And maybe you're polite and you go to the person and you say, thank you. Really appreciate it. Running a risk of getting another one next time. But anyway, you're polite and you say that. Now, can you imagine being in God's position? You're specific about the offerings. It must be an unblemished young animal. It must be the best in your crawl. And this is how you are to bring it. And to the priests, this is how you are to sacrifice it. And when you approach the altar, this is how you do it. All right? You're that specific. And the people come and they totally disregard the specifications. And someone is coming with a blind animal and is bringing it to the offering because he can't sell it in the market. No one wants this thing. Well, this one is sick. I think next week it will be dead. It's better we use it to offer it to the Lord today before it dies. And the people who were entrusted with the responsibility of saying to people, whoa, whoa, not that one. That one is totally unacceptable. Are they the ones who say, no, 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 bring that. Bring that one. We will offer it to the Lord your God and he will bless you. Just bring it along. Bring it along. You know, the preachers, bring the lame and the blind and the sick. Bring them all. We shall offer them to the Lord our God and he shall bless us. Right? And that's what the people of God were doing during the time of Malachi. Aaron? Just the tail end of the generation that had come back from exile, that had worked so hard to build the city walls, that's what they were now doing. They understood exactly what God wanted them to do. They understood. But they chose to not Listen to God. I remember one story where God said to Israel, don't go to war with the Philistines. And they said, we want to go to war with the Philistines. And God says, don't. I have not handed them over to you. And they said, no, we want to. And we will. And God says, all right. If you do, I will not fight for you. And Israel says, sure. We will make you fight for us. And the plan was, we will take the covenant to war. God will not risk it to allow the covenant to be captured by the foreign nations. 
If he refuses to go to war with us, we will take the covenant to, to war. In doing so, we will force God to come to war and defend it. You see the plan? God says, this is what I want you to do. And God's people say, this is what we want to do. And God says, don't do it. And they say, no, we will. And he says, okay, if you want to do it, go on your own. Says, no, no, no. You will come along with us. Whether you like it or you don't, you will come along with us because we're telling you so. And here, God says, this is what I want for the offerings. They says, no, this is what we will give you. And you will accept it. And you will bless us. And you will bless us according to our demands. Crazy, isn't it? It sounds crazy in every way. It's just like, who does that? Who does that? This nation, they understood that the father is honored by the son. Now the son honors the father, respects the father of the, of the home. The servant respects the master. The entire system was built on that. Children honors their parents. Servants honor their masters. And if you fail to honor your parents or your master, there were consequences for it. And that's why in this passage, God uses this example. Because they understood the culture. They understood what was expected of them. And God says, if I am your father, where is my honor? See that in verse 6? The Bible keeps saying God is the father of Israel. And if he is, where is his honor? Are you not supposed to obey me as your father? And if I am your master, where is my honor? Are you not supposed to show respect to your master? Don't you think those are fair questions? Don't you think as parents sometimes we feel like that? With our children, when they display incredible disrespect of us as parents, they shout at us, they do all the stuff, and, and you feel disrespected. And you feel, I, I, are, you, are you not supposed to sh show respect to me as your Mom, as your dad, huh? irrespective really of what, what's happening, but just the, the, the response to whatever you say as a parent, you, you feel sometimes. Shouldn't you show a little, just a little bit more respect than that? And God says, just in case you miss the point, let me give you another example. Would you offer those animals to your governor? Now here's a quick background. Israel was paying tax to the Persians because they gave them freedom. All right? They're the ones who conquered the Babylonians and set them free to go back home. But then they were paying tax for the freedom. I mean, pay tax for your freedom. Now, God says to them, let's think for a moment. Come end of the month or the year, whenever they were paying tax, would you take your blind, your lame, your sick animal to your governor and say, oh, governor, how grateful we are for our freedom. Here's your tax. Would the governor accept it? And the answer is, no ways. 
No ways the governor would accept that. And here's the thing. They would not even think of doing it. They would not even think of taking those animals to the governor. They would look for the best and offer the best to the governor because the governor had the right to take all of it. But when it comes to God, you can imagine someone sitting at home and rationalizing the whole deal. Financially, we are not doing well. It makes no sense for us to take the best animal, kill it for a sacrifice. When we could sell it and make more money from it. It makes more sense to offer the sick one because it's going to die anyway. And God will understand because of our financial situation. You get it? You see the point? Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. All right. Why don't you take Rover? Yeah, Rover has saved for a long time. It's time to let Rover go. We take Rover, and we hope by the time we get to the priest, Rover is still alive. And we offer him as a sacrifice to the Lord our God, for we love him. And God says to his people, I've had enough of it. I have told you what to do. And you consistently disobey my word. You keep bringing these offerings to the temple and I can't stand them anymore. I am sick and tired of them. You offer them to me and you expect favor and you genuinely expect me to accept them and you genuinely expect me to bless you. When your heart is so far away from me, why do you expect me? Why do you expect me to continue to be gracious to you? You notice that? You would not offer these to the governor because he won't show favor to you, but you offer them to me and you expect me to show favor to you. Like the governor, I will not show favor to you. Am I not greater than your governor? I mean, all the questions God is asking his people here are fair and just questions. Am I not greater than your governor? And it's good for us, as Sean asked this morning, to think and ask ourselves this morning, what are we offering the Lord? Are we offering him our best or our leftovers? Could it be that as CCH family, we are withholding our best and offering a lip service to the Lord our God? And has convinced ourselves that God understands our predicament. Now the heartbreaking section is that verse 10. So often we just read over it. But, you know, while God is addressing the priests, but he's also addressing everybody in Israel. Uh, he says, oh, that there were one among you who would shut the doors that you might not kindle the fire on my altar in vain. Oh, how I wish you could just stop. I have no pleasure, and here's the thing, in you, all right? 
He's not saying, I have no pleasure in your offerings. No, no. I have no pleasure in you. Because it is you who's bringing the offering. The animals are not guilty. It's the animal owner who's guilty. I have no pleasure in you, says the Lord of hosts, and I will not accept an offering from your dirty hands. Okay? You can bring your lame animal. You can say all the right prayers. You can kneel before the altar. You can ask your priest, your wicked priest, I might add, to follow the rules that Moses had put in place. And he can follow them to the T. But I will not accept your offer. I will not. So, you can just have a bry with your lame animal and your wicked priest can eat your leftovers. But leave me out of it. You get it? I'm trying to use the modern language because really that's just what God was saying to Israel. Just, just leave me out of it. Leave me out of it. I'm sick and tired of your insult and your mocking. Because every time they come to the Lord's altar, that's what they were doing. You are not worthy of anything better than this sick animal. You deserve it. And that's why we're bringing it to you. And God says, I've had enough of your polluted um, animals. It would be better... Hey? It would be better to shut the gates to the temple. But since all of you are in agreement that the Lord's name must be defiled, you can continue. But I will not accept it. I mean, how sad is that? How sad is that? But this is a warning for Israel. It's a warning for us. It's a warning from the Lord to you and me. Can you imagine God say this morning, looking at Christ Church Hillcrest, all that there were one among you who would shut the CCH doors that you might not gather in my name with your polluted praise and offering. It would be better to close the doors of the church than to dishonor my name Sunday by Sunday. Can you imagine that? We gather like this this morning and we praise the Lord and we sing and he's like, I just don't want to hear it. Don't want to hear it. There are about hundreds of you here and there are only six hearts here. The rest of you are not here. Can you imagine that? It's a warning we need to take to heart as God's people. And God says to Israel, whether you worship me correctly or you don't, this you might know, and this you must know. The nations will honor my name. They will bring the sacrifices of praise in the way that will bring honor to my name. For I am the king. All right? For I am the king. And that passage has got so much in it to say, but I don't have the time to be able to take, verse, take you down verse by verse. But here was the heart of the problem, which we need to take to heart. Israel failed to worship the Lord with a pure heart. 
sacrifices were, were an act of worship to the Lord our God. And they failed to worship him with pure heart. Not a perfect heart, but a pure one. A heart that is devoted to God. That time of sacrifice is a time of confessing sins to the Lord. I have failed you and I'm bringing this sacrifice as an offering. That you may forgive me of my sins. But it was also a time of renewing fellowship and communion with the Lord their God. A great time to come to God and count your blessings and say, without you, I wouldn't be able to stand here and say this. Without you, I would not be able to own this or have that. Without you, I would never have been able to do this. Lord, I just want to say thank you from the bottom of my heart because you have blessed me beyond measure. And this might be my best but I wish I had something better and it is nothing more than a token of my appreciation it's a time of giving thanks and praise him it's a special time with God you remember that time in Genesis where the Bible says in the cool of the day God would come to have a conversation with Adam it must have been one of the most special times together. And sacrifice time was, was meant to be like that. A special time with God. Hey? Is it not right and proper for us this morning as a church to look carefully at our own hearts. To ask ourselves a simple question. Are we worshipping God with a pure heart? Is the Lord pleased with you? Is the Lord pleased with me this morning? Hey, you remember the verse in Romans where Paul says, We must offer ourselves as a living sacrifice to the Lord our God, for that is a true act of worship. Remember that verse? A question this morning. Are we offering ourselves, first and foremost, as a living sacrifice to the Lord our God? Or are we just bringing our things to the Lord, but not ourselves? And two, is the Lord pleased? with our offering. So I'm separating the two because the Lord says to Israel, I am not pleased with you first. And then he deals with the offerings. And so the question for us is, is the Lord pleased with us? Are we offering ourselves as a living sacrifice to him? And then are we offering the best to him? Is our offering an acceptable one to the Lord our God? Is it? You know, God is gracious. Remember Cain and Abel? They both brought some offerings to the Lord, didn't they? And God says to Cain, Whoa, Cain, there's something not right here. Let's fix this. Because Satan is roaring and he wants to devour you. Let's sort this out. And we know he didn't listen. 
And we know that the Lord rejected his offering. And we need to ask ourselves the questions. And I know we often look at this and we're just like, oh, we're so glad that Jesus died on the cross for us. And God is, doesn't really care about all those Old Testament rules and regulations anymore. We can do as we please. We're wrong. We're wrong. God still wants us to worship him with a pure heart. He wants us to give the very best we have. Are you giving the best? Giving God what you don't need is not giving at all. Yeah? Let, let me give you an example. We, we, we pick here at church for collecting your leftovers. Right? Now and again I say, hey, if you've got old clothes, um, just bring them along. We will take care of them. Please bring them. And so often you bring them and we take them either to Tolutando or we're collecting for someone or we're going to sell them at the jumble sale. We collect them. But never ever consider that a gift to the Lord. Never. It's just a gift to Jomo. All right? And I receive it as such, not a gift from God, from you. And we will treat it as such, help the people. But when you're bringing something to the Lord, and that's, by the way, one of the reasons we are not sitting as a council saying, who's giving and who's not giving? And now and again, you see um, the treasurer coming to you and say, hey, we haven't seen your giving at all. We are asking you to please start giving. We don't. We don't, because we know that that is your business and God. If you are withholding that, you're not withholding that against us. You're withholding it against God. It's not our business. It's God's business. We can stand here and ask you, please give. Because we have financial commitments that we have, and the only way we can meet those commitments is through the generosity of God's people. But you can honestly say, Jomo, I owe you nothing. And you're right. You don't. But if God has put something in your hand, God expects it to be used in the kingdom. So if you give what you don't need or leftovers, it really doesn't count as a gift. If you, if you are giving grudgingly, it really doesn't bring any honor to God at all. You can imagine that. Someone is giving you a gift, but you can see that the person is grinding his teeth. Really doesn't want to do it. Like when we give Saz our money. Right? He knows that we do so with grinding teeth, but he doesn't care. He'll take it anyway. And he will chase you for more if he thinks you didn't give him all that you're supposed to do. All right? But God is not like that. God gives you this much. And he says, just give back to me 10%. The rest you do as you please. And we find it difficult to do just that. Don't give grudgingly. The Bible says the Lord loves the cheerful giver. And serving in the ministry only when it suits you. You know, I am a busy person and I can't really get involved in a church life. But when I am not busy, when I have free time, then I will serve. Well, God does not accept that kind of service. It's not service at all. We might be very grateful that you made yourself available once every three months. But to God, it's pathetic. It's totally unacceptable. It's, you know, sometimes it feels terrible to be a pastor. Because 
I sometimes finish and say, did I actually encourage you to walk with the Lord today? Or, or did I just pull a stick and whack you to death? Because, because I, I hate that. But I think, I think for us to grow in the Lord, for, for our hearts to, to be cleaned of the athlete corrosion, whatever you call, what's that word? My Zunglish is failing me. Corrosion, right? Corrosion. So, so, so I sometimes feel like, you know, I'm that person on Sunday morning with a scrapping brush and cheek and doing this on your heart because there's so much corrosion taking place. And it's uncomfortable for me, and I know it is uncomfortable for you. But what must we do if that's what is needed? It's got to be done. God has called us to serve him with pure hearts, guys. And let's do our very, very best to serve him. That's all he asked of. And that's all he was asking Israel. Just take your best in your crow. All right. The other person might have a better animal than yours. And God is not going to hold you accountable that you did not offer that animal, which is not yours. He is asking you to get the best out of your own crow. This morning, are we giving him our very best? Because that's all he's asking. We're going to approach the Lord's table right now. This was God's best gift to undeserving people like you and me. As you take this today, holding it, just remember, it's a symbol of God's best for you. May the body of our Lord Jesus Christ, which was given for you, keep your body and soul for everlasting life. Take and eat this, remembering that Christ died for you. Feed on him in your heart with thanksgiving. May the blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, which was poured out for you, keep your body and soul for everlasting life. Drink this, remembering that Christ's blood was shed for you, and be thankful. Thanks, Jama, for those words. When you bring us the word of God, we are always encouraged. What I'm a bit concerned about now is I have to pray over this, these offerings. <laughs> it can be a bit ner nerve-wracking, that. But anyway... <laughs> Thank you for those words. They are the words of our God. Can we give thanks for the offerings? Lord God, we thank you for these offerings and tithes that have been brought into your storehouse here at Christ Church Hillcrest. We ask that you will bless them, that you will multiply them, and that they might be used to further your kingdom. And as we consider and plan our tithes and offerings for the next week, for the next month, and perhaps for the next year. I pray that you, we might take the words of Malachi to heart, that we might check our hearts and make sure that we are giving as we should. And as we go out in our lives this, this week ahead, I pray that we will give our lives as living sacrifices that we might look for opportunities to spread your gospel to the growth and the glory of your kingdom. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.